Um, so a bit of a table of content. So I spoke a little bit about myself again, um, mining engineer, so uh, not what I would class in your uh, category, but certainly a mining engineer and certainly someone who's been involved with banks and operations and insurance companies and investors and owners, et cetera, et cetera. Talk a little bit about the background. The standard analysis we would have applied to this particular uh, example, the, the slope, X, uh, slope X analysis that we did, the difference, and then about the, the actual performance and then get to the lessons learned. Anyway, there's a photograph of me, so it's a bit clearer, but mind you, that's taken a long time ago. More hair and of a different color, but I'm sure a lot of people have the same issue. All right, some of the background. Um, in a recent assignment, um, uh, and this was back in about 2019, we were approached by the administrator of a, a mining company uh, to see if there was a way to get a particular mine in Australia back into um, profitability. Now, I'm sure a lot of you understand about what administrators do, but just for those who don't, uh, we're, we're a, when a mining company, and this isn't just a mine, this is the whole company, when the company can't progress on uh, profitably, um, there's a requirement on the directors to announce that to the market and deal with it. So they, so they're not, a, a company in Australia is not allowed to trade whilst insolvent. In other words, they have to be able to pay their bills. And directors watch that carefully because it's an enormously onerous requirement. Um, and if they perceive that this is not going to happen, they have a, quite a few alternatives. But certainly one of the major ones is bring the company into voluntary administration. The administrator then has to do something. He has to say, well, how do I pay the debtors? Who are the debtors? You know, what can happen? So we work, we work a lot with one particular administrator here in Australia, and he bought this particular mine, which was basically the whole company to us in early 2019. You know, and, and the second dot point is really what I remember him ringing up saying these exact words, how can we get this mine back into production so the jobs are all on site and provide value to the shareholders? And, and that is a really big task. They aren't, a lot of uh, admitted voluntary administrators or administrators are seen as kind of undertakers. Let's just sell it and get a few cents to the dollar. But this particular one, we've done a lot of work with it. And those were his very words. He was really interested in the jobs of everybody on site. You know, he, when we went up the site, he, he said, take up time to look around this whole place and realise that everybody and everybody's family relies upon what we're going to do. Um, again, no small task. Uh, so what we had to do was create a mine plan at work. Obviously, we were standing in a mine that it didn't work, um, and we had to work out what we could do to get this going again. Now, we were we're a bit. I want to say lucky. I'm not sure. Um, I've got to be careful. Um, but when we got there, we and this is a bit strange, but you guys may have bumped into this before. But we realized that they, this company wasn't mining the ore body. It was this massive ore body that they weren't mining because there was a, a, a wall of, of the pit that had to be moved and they you know, didn't, they thought they could do it somewhere else. They could, thought they could find ore that wasn't near this wall. Um, so they were rat holing, I use that expression. They were just digging small blocks away from that particular wall. However, the ore body itself was uh, about 30 to 60 metres wide and disappeared under the, that particular uh, western wall. Um, so it's pretty easy in a lot of respects. I said to the administrator, we're just going to get enough cash so we can move that wall or part thereof back far enough so we can expose the ore body. Now that might sound like um, mining 101, <laughs> we thought it was, but obviously this company couldn't do it for a whole bunch of other reasons. So that was our aim. So we began to build a um, 
quite a quite a good method of doing that in terms of the earth movement, in terms of the time and cost. And everything was going quite well. We had, um, importantly, the main investor. Um, you know, when we first met them, they they were, I think they owned about thirty percent of the company. And they were about to bail. They were about to say we're just going to cut our losses and go. But we presented this quite good model and method and DCF to these uh, people. And they said, no, nah, we're in, we'll stay in. Now the gold price was creeping up, which also helped us. But then very late in a piece, out of the blue, we received a, a document. And in that document, there were two lines. It was, it was an unexpected opinion by their independent, but consultant engineer. And there were, as I say, in this report, there were two lines. And those two lines basically said this, put a in-wall ramp uh, extra to the current, uh, uh, sorry, in-wall berm, extra to the current berms in the wall. In other words, flatten the wall out. And that berm needs to be 20 meters wide. So um, that was actually just two lines of print. But I said to the um, administrator, well, those two lines of print just cost you just over 60 million Australian dollars. That's how, that's the diff, that's what it would have cost to do what that consultant said. So obviously the administrator said, well, what's he based this on? Is it true? Is it reasonable? Well, you know, tell us about it. What's going on? So it was a very, it, it basically, if we had taken that to the investor, he would have bailed. And it was a really big problem. It was a large geotechnical boom and had an enormous consequence on the DCF. As I said, it was about $60 million worth of earth movement, which was circa about a third of the DCF, you know, really killed the project. Um, but we, we had the commitment, if we didn't need to do that, the investors would stay the course. So, and this is where it gets to numerical modeling. Um, the administrator said to us, and this is why I wanted to talk about this to you, you, you people today, to show you how important um, some of this work is. He said, what can we do? I said, well, look, we could get another kind of normal view of the world, um, an opinion. But I can tell you, we could get numerous opinions. And those opinions uh, pretty much just that, just someone's opinion. It's certainly based on some logic, but if we if we said as mining one, if we said something different, we'll just be arguing with people for, for ages, you know, because it will be our opinion compared to their opinion, compared to somebody else's opinion. So I said, there's another way we could do it because at that stage, um, uh, I was introduced to Cavrock or some a year or so prior to that. I said, we could do some numerical modeling to e examine this problem. The, the administrator said to us, well, you know, what's the numerical modeling? I said, well, actually, if we use, you know, FLAC, arguably it's world's best practice. And sorry, this is in 2019, at that time, world's best practice. And I think, I think it's nearly, you cannot argue it. If we get a result that works, and we're not saying we will, but, but I think we will, and I'll bring you to that, um, we will, um, it'll be very hard for someone to argue with it because it is simply world's best practice. So this is a view of the mine, and I'm sure you people now, after hearing all these words, are more interested in some pictures. But this shows a, a view of the, of the mine uh, looking to the north. That little truck there in the front, that probably carries, and just looking at it, I don't know, 150 tonne or thereabout, maybe 100, maybe 100 tonne. So it's a really large pit. <clears throat> Things to notice in this on the left-hand side photograph is all that water in the pit. In fact, that had been pumped down. That water was uh, another... I don't know, 20 or 40 metres high. Can you see my cursor? If, if you can, it was up to about here. Up to... Uh, where yes, we, we can see. Yeah, up to about that level. So they had been pumping it down. 
So this stuff is dipping to the west. The ore body lives, um, the major part of the ore body lives under here, this area here. And this shows you what the ore body looks like. But the, uh, this was a, a kind of reasonable view of what the, 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 the structure for the rock is. In other words, dipping to the west as well. So um, uh, pretty weak material, very, well, they had a lot of problems on this eastern side. But that's not so much of an issue because that, that the ore body wasn't there. The ore body lives under here. But you could see, remember I mentioned the term rat holing and you could see the guys where they were digging here. In fact, that little spot there is an example of a section of ore that they dug out. And, I was, and that was even a big one. And we were just saying, this is ridiculous. But importantly, dipping to the west. Now, the next photograph, I'll just show you, you'll you get a better understanding of what's happening. This is now looking to the south. So the previous photograph was taken from about this position. But now you can see the volume of water. You can see a waste, uh, sorry, a tailings dam up here. And, and in fact, that digger there, and this is something about the mine plan, he was digging on the final wall, which was pretty, for our, from our perspective, you know, pretty crazy. We're saying, you know, you're just digging in the wrong spot. Um, again, well, that, that, that's certainly a 150 ton truck, that one. So they were using some fairly big trucks. Um, you can see lots of this um, black shaley stuff on the, on the eastern side, which meant failure after failure. But importantly, let's have a look at um, this area here. This dirt here was pushed over the edge, whereas this dirt is basically what this pit had been like for the last, now when did they mine it? They must have mined it about mid nineties. So I'll go, I'll focus in on that area, which is really important. So this pit was underwater up to about here and had been since, as I said, I think about the mid nineties, maybe around circa 2000. As they pumped it down, this is the what presented itself. Basically, no significant uh, failures. There was a, a couple of small ones, but but you all got being geotechnical people, you you would understand why. Because look at the dip of all this stuff. It's all dipping to the west, so this material is stacked on top of each other, and, and so really difficult to have large failures because it's just. The more you dig, you, the more you expose it. It just sits on itself. So to give you some um, understanding, these are typically five meter berms with 20 meter benches. So we looked at this and went, this ground is really, really good. And you want us to put another 20 meter row berm in here. So this and that's what the administrator is saying to me he's, you know he's saying it to me as a mining guy why it doesn't look logical what you're saying is logical it's sitting on itself we can't see any failures it's been left alone it's, it, it should be if it had failed it should have already been failed the berm's not deeper it's up higher it was going to be up here somewhere it was just illogical all right so how do we solve this problem so I went and saw Abu and we talked about it a little bit. Um, on the left-hand side was the two-dimensional, uh, let me get it right. Yeah, the two-dimensional view of the wall with a standard analysis. Um, now, the important part, you could see where they wanted to put the, this berm in here and reduce the overall angle to uh, 50 degrees. Uh, we had a factor of safety, and I think it was a. It was between. I've just got to check, but I think it was between one and one point three. So, from a two D perspective, it. Uh, sorry, he thought he solved the problem because this is what he had beforehand. Without the burn, from a two D perspective, fifty three degrees, one point one. So you can see how just that one little piece a berm changes that so much and that changes the whole business so much that it really really caused uh, problems with what we were doing 
So that was a 2D analysis. So from a 2D perspective, it's really hard to argue with. You know, and I'm sure if we had have argued, we'd be still arguing. So we had to find another way. So we went into the um, using slope X. And running that slope X bridge or the add-on as or plug-in as Julian called it into um, uh, FLAC, these are some of the numbers we were getting back. So we did it with the ramp and we, this is a plan view. And we noticed that certainly up to the northern end of the ore body, there was a, a, a somewhat of an issue, but not, not too bad. It was, um, uh, it was 1.3 or 1.5 factor of safety, but most of it was 1.5 to 2, which is in, I, I think everyone would, you know, with due understanding would conclude that that's a fairly reasonable number. So then we said, well, look, so we back analyze the ramp view of the world, and then we analyzed another view with no ramp. And we came out to a, well, it's very similar view of the world. Certainly in the Northwestern corner, the, um, there was less of a, a smaller factor of safety, but it still was, when we looked at it from a, a numerical modeling perspective, quite acceptable. Now, this is what we um, said to the mine owners, we think we've solved your problem. Now, importantly, um, this solution was done really, really quickly because um, the, that, that Slopex does work quickly. And, and I'm a consultant, so I'm just gonna be careful here. It was done far too cheaply. <laughs> we, um, I, I think the orders of magnitude for this solution that we provided to the mine owner was certainly well and truly below 20,000 Australian dollars of work, which might sound ridiculously low, but this is some of the advantages of Slopex, which I will talk a little bit about at, towards the end of the, 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 my talk. But that's why I wanted, that's why I become enamored with this. I said you know, to the guys, is this real? I said, this is FLAC. You could run FLAC and get the same number, FLAC 3. And we, and we, we're confident. And it, you know, I, I, and I showed the client, and this is why this type of work is so important to the, our industry, because it enables cheap, when I say cheap, inexpensive and efficient in terms of times analysis of complex mining problems. Um, this is um, um, a paper that's been presented before, and it talks about the angle of, um, uh, of ramps and how important they are on on, on mines and and I know we come up with numbers as geotech engineers go yes angle but it's so critical it can kill you know can well it can really hurt projects but we've always got you know our concern of protecting people at the same time so having a, the right number is important um, so. Like anybody, we could just offer that up and say, here's the solution and walk away. But I wanted to also convey what actually happened. So they, they actually did this. They said, let's, let's go into mining. Um, we had to do a final design. Again, we still had this slightly problem um, in, in the Northwest corner, but that wasn't where this ramp was even meant to go. The ramp was meant to be on the Western side. It wasn't even meant to be in the Northwest corner. And we knew that was a bit of a problem, but as luck would have it, there was no ramp in the near term that was going to be anywhere near it. This shows the final ramp for the whole pit, but in the near term, we weren't going to be anywhere near it. And also they wanted to push the wall back anyway. So it, it wasn't so much of an issue. Oops, there we go. So this was the actual performance. So that on the left-hand side, we predicted that area to be problematic. And, and so on the left-hand side, there's a, a plan view of where it was going to be. It, this one on the right-hand side is, a, is a, a view in three dimensions of that uh, lower factor of safety. And in fact, what happened is we had a slump in that left-hand corner, pretty close to where we said, and it was innocuous, it was well expected. 
protected. It was managed. It was nowhere near a ramp. And it, in fact, I'm not even sure that the client even, sorry, they did mention it to us, but it was kind of in passing. It wasn't like a phone call in the middle of the night saying, we've got problems. It was more like, oh, by the way, what you said would happen actually happened and uh, everything's going well. So what that meant for the, the business was that, and I remember that when I said the gold price was increasing. So as I'm talking, the gold price has gone up a bit. This mine gets back into production. This company gets taken out of voluntary administration. All the creditors were paid 100 cents in the dollar and they continued the business. So this company was saved, literally saved from the ashes. There was some recapitalization moving around um, some some debts and the like, but basically went back onto the stock exchange. People were astonished. They thought they thought that the administrator would bring in the receiver and take the oxyacetylene um, torch to the mill, chop it up and sell it. But uh, no, they continued on. So it just shows the power of this type of analysis. But it also it also goes to another end. This is an examination of slow picks. But I thought I'd just mention, I haven't got any slides for this, but we've used it also with Stopex. And some of our clients, and especially in North America, well, no, not even North America, here in Australia too, enormous problems with tailing stamps. And so we're looking at using the power of this um, these products and the power of flak to do um, lots of what if scenarios. Um, so looking at different mining methods, you know, pillar arrangements, pillar placements, removal of pillars, etc. To see what we, you know what we can do. We're doing one now. In fact, we were doing it yesterday where we we're talking about uh, changing rib pillars. But, but one that's come out of it, for example, and in fact, I've, after this, this presentation, I've got to go to work, work and talk to a client about this very problem. They've got a really, really limited area for tailings dams on, their surf, on the surface. So much so that they probably may not get a permit to mine because it's environmentally very sensitive. Um, and they, they plan a very large tailing stamp. So what we are doing is we're developing a mining method that involves doing dry stack tails underground. So it's a sequence of pillar arrangements so that we can isolate the, the, the dried tailings um, after they're placed in, in the underground environment. Now, it's not with paste. There is some cement. But one of the things we, we can do, because the dry stack tails are 93% solids, we have a much higher density of the tailings, which means we can put more, more tailings underground than we can do with paste. But also because it's dry, we can backfill many, many more um, uh, cavities. So not only can we fill the stopes, but we can fill all the accesses from the decline to the stopes and push it in with doses. So we, we may get to the stage where we're close to, and we're saying at the moment, 85% of the material underground. Now that takes a huge problem away from this company. And in fact, it, at the moment, we're early days, but the, um, the, uh, uh, the government saying, well, if you can do that, you know, we can live with that. We can live with a small times down, but we don't want a huge one. We can, if you've done, only going to be 10 or 15 percent of an all one you know we can talk turkey on that so so the numerical modeling and, and the performance can really really change minds it can change the dc you know the discounted you know, cash flow of these businesses all these proposals it can actually change it so dramatically it turns something that's impossible into something that we can we can do um, it's be, we're getting a lot of traction on this um, but this can be done, you know, without Cabrock. You don't have to use Cabrock. You just got to use, you know, do, you know, use Flak 3D. But I'm sure as we speak to many people, there are 
and, and that's as Julian was saying before, um, flat 3D um, operators are pretty rare beasts. There's not a lot of them in the world. Um, and I've been to lots of companies where there's, you know, there's all the books on the shelf, flat 3D, all the manuals, but it's, it's probably never been used. But it's, this is, we think it's opening the door and that's why we wanted to share this, this, this talk to enable um, uh, people to, to use it. Certainly, 2D analysis is really, really important and really, really useful. But when the, uh, sometimes when the, the problems get very, very complicated uh, and we know that we're going to be in a, uh, 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 it's going to be discussed at many, many levels, you know, not only between consultants, but then from, you know, uh, from the mine operators up to the mine management, to the board level, to the, to the um, regulators, we need to be able to say, well, we've got this world's best practice analysis so that we can go forward. So this is getting towards the end, which I'm sure you're all very pleased about, <laughs> but, you know, these are some things we've learned over time. And, 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 and it, it does go to what um, Abu said about change and the like. And sometimes, you know, the, the current industry standard methods are just not best practice. You know, you, we all sit here and go, yep, what I'm doing when what I know is best practice, I'm doing everything possible. The question is, is there something that's better? Um, so some of this numerical modeling that we're doing now can, be, can actually be done cheaper and faster than the standard methods. And this is really an important part, you know, you know, we're doing another feasibility for another company and they're saying, oh, we've got to drill some more geotechnical drill holes. I said, but we're revitalizing this old mine. And they said, yes. I said, we've got stopes in this old mine. Yes, we have. And we've got a decline to it. And we've got many of them. Yes, yes. And we can go in and look at them. Yep. I said, well, we've got more geotechnical information than you'll ever get from any drill hole logging. We're just going to the stopes. I, I think we've got, right at the moment, there might be 20 of them. So what we've also done is been able to back analyze any failures in those stopes using the stope itself as the drill hole. Now we've added drill holes to it as well, but that's, that's what we can get. In other words, this back analysis so that we calibrate these models and because we can run them really, really quickly and often rather do one flak analysis, you can actually do many, many and you can calibrate it to any past performance so that you can be more predictive in the future. So these tools, and I suppose this is the wash up, they are changing how we look at um, projects. They're changing and, uh, and, I, and I am sure um, you will see more of this, whether it's flak or whether it's other people's um, 3D finite element analysis modeling, it, 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 this will become the standard. I mean, again, I go back to 1995 when I looked at all those rock bolts in the hang wall and my foreman said, you know, uh, either we put too many in or not enough. Well, that's not going to happen anymore. The future will be, how do we do this analysis? How do we get better and more predictive? And certainly we've, as an industry, we've come in an enormous ways. And, that, and now we've, we'll, be, can't, we'll be doing, we'll, the, the, I believe this is very much the beginning of this, this journey to do more of this type of work. Anyway, I'd like to just say thank you for listening to me for the last, I've just been looking at my watch here for the last nearly 40 minutes, but that I hope that gives you somewhat of, of a perspective from a, from a mind manager or from, from a person not necessarily in your field, but someone who has to take your work and try and turn it into money. Because that's what we're really trying to do in this business. And sometimes when I pick up the work and I get take it to the board of directors, you know, that's when life can get very, very tough. So it's important that we've got stuff that we can take to those, those directors and those shareholders that they can put their hard-earned, and they do put their hard-earned superannuation funds, their college funds, all their investments 
because they believe us. So, you know, when we do a design for somebody, you know, whether it's a government, whether it's a, a mining company, you know, we're really working for lots of people. We think they're all rich people, but lots of them are mums and dads investors. Lots of them have put their hard earned money into hopefully having a, a project or a return on their investment that helps their children. Um, so when you get to having done this for 43, 44 years, you kind of stand back and you, and you say a lot of this has not only got to help our grandchildren, but it's also got to be something our grandchildren can say, yeah, look, those people did a good job. You know, they respected the environment. They took care of things. They certainly extracted the minerals we will need, we need today, but we're going to need even more in the future courtesy of, you know, transition to different energy sources. And we've got to just get better and better and better at it. And um, it's through companies like Rock Science and Cavrock that that happens. So, um, again, thank you very much for your um, patience and attention. And thank you for TV sem seminars for allowing me to give this short, short, <laughs> this uh, brief talk. Thank you very much.